The Chair recognizes the Honourable Member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is indeed my pleasure to rise on behalf of the people of East Grand Bahama to make a contribution uh, to this motion uh, for the mid-year budget presentation. I too would like to express our condolences uh, to uh, the senior clerk, Mr. Tynes, on the passing of his dear wife, and certainly uh, we pray for the family. Um, and, and, and her soul. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Prime Minister, who spoke last week in this mid-year budget presentation, I stand before you today very concerned, as are many Bahamians, about our nation's economy and its future. After all the promises made and with all that has happened in this country since May 2012, Mr. Speaker, this government has been more lucky than good. <coughs> to quote the Minister of Finance, the sunlight is broken through the clouds. Bright days lie before us now. We are standing tall, our heads held high, our hearts brimming over, with faith in our country and optimism about our future. It almost sounds like a national anthem or something, Mr. Speaker. Very nice poetry. But most Bahamians would want to know, what world does this government live in? With unemployment at 16% in New Providence, 18.6% in Grand Bahama, 20.3% in Abaco, and with youth unemployment at 31.2%, the highest it's ever been. What are they talking about? Many families feel, find themselves no better off today than they were in 2012. And in many instances, they are far worse off than they were as job losses continue and lost opportunities grow. Many have expressed their regrets and disillusionment in this government and their inability to simply do what they said they would do. In other words, they have failed us, Mr. Speaker. Today, we live in a country in which rising crime now accompanies rising prices, rising unemployment, and a rising number of young people with declining hopes of a stake here at home for them. I guess you might call them discouraged workers. <laughs> Even while the government foreshadows a desperate hope that Baja Mar will rescue its failure to deliver the 10,000 immediate jobs promised, despite having almost three years to do so, and Mr. Speaker, in a period of general economic recovery, both domestically and internationally. Despite the fuzzy math, that side continues to repeat in this honorable house to confuse the statistics. The truth is that the total number of unemployed persons is 2,415 higher today than it was when this government came to office. And unfortunately, <coughs> it is rising. So yes, we must all pray for Bahamar, its success and trust that the ongoing dispute over the road cost will not mar that opening date. That's correct. Not, bar, not mar, baha, mar. I learned from the best. I learned from the best. Mr. Speaker, the government is seeking to take credit for the external global recovery, which has positively stimulated some pockets of our economy. But these were the same external global factors which during 2007 to 2012 were responsible for the very negative uh, downturn in our economy, which before coming to office, this government convinced Bahamians did not exist. 
Today, they are boasting that we have weathered the storm. The worst is behind us. But oh, how their tongues have changed since coming to office. Mr. Speaker, with the continued rise in unemployment, the unacceptable scourge of crime, the increased dependence on our welfare system, the inequality of opportunities and disenfranchisement of our youth, there is much that this government needs to do and very little it has done to boast about. After listening, watching, and, see and seeing this PLP administration at work, it is no doubt this government <coughs> has been more lucky than good. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, the average household income has decreased over the last two and a half years in real terms, making the call for a minimum wage and pension review more relevant than ever as the social burden is passed onto the private sector to cover, cover inefficiencies, waste, and grandiose promises. Mr. Speaker, the government projects that real output in our economy is expected to be over $600 million, larger, $600 million larger in 2017. A very futuristic statement, Mr. Speaker. And to the informed investor, full of speculation and undeclared risks. To take this projection into context, however, it would be useful to note that the Bahamian economy, economic share of the world's total GDP adjusted for purchasing power was 0.1% in 2009 <laughs> and is forecasted to be 0.1% in 2015. No change. In other words, my fellow Bahamians don't get swing by the numbers as there are, these are all dependent on global economic forecasts, not on the Bahamas in isolation. As the government is quick to point out when it fits their purpose, we have an open economy, and, that, and it is vulnerable to external conditions, particularly the United States economy. And so as one goes, so does the other, with very little to do with direct government effort. But, Mr. Speaker, what does the central bank say about the economy? The data seems to indicate that perhaps it's too early to predict success for this government. According to the latest central bank fiscal real sector in indicator schedule, total debt from May 2012 to December 2014 has grown by a whopping $2 billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, from three million five hundred fifty-nine, sorry, three billion three hundred fifty-nine million to five billion five hundred sixty-five million. The external portion of that debt, Mr. Speaker, the most risky part, has grown by seven hundred and ninety-seven million over the same period, Mr. Speaker. Yet. The government brags about the success of its plan to date. How exactly do they measure success, Mr. Speaker? And Weston seems to be concerned that the deficit was five billion back in 2012. I think that's what he's trying to say. Go to the central bank records, Mr. Speaker. It's there. According to the bank, the central bank's credit quality conditions. Sorry, according to the, to the central bank, credit quality conditions remain stressed, with private, private sector loan arrears increasing. Mortgage and commercial loan de delinquencies were also higher. Loan loss provisions have increased, and credit policies have tightened. And this not include the $100 million in bad loans that was transferred to Bahamas Resolve Corporation. But yet, they boast. What exactly are they boasting about, Mr. Speaker? Had it not been for the significant drop in oil prices, this situation, coupled with the inefficiencies of our energy sector and value-added tax, many businesses, I dare say, would not have survived this hostile, hostile period. And inflation would have been a much bigger issue. This government has indeed been more lucky than good. Mr. Speaker, instead of taking advantage of lower oil prices, however, 
The government continues to fumble with its economic reform and BEC policy and have seemingly made no concrete advancement on this crucial fund. Today's newspaper headline in the business section talks about engine overhauls to meet Baja Mar requirements as if this is something new. They did not expect Baja Mar to, become, to open. But this was not even worth a single line in the mid-year statement, Mr. Mr. Speaker. Not one single line. We have a minister one wonders what is happening to the restructuring process. If we will ever get a straight answer and action from this government on BEC, on mortgage relief, on banking sector reform, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Minister of State talked about the advances that were made in the deficit. And so I just had, had to take a look to see if I could understand what he was talking about. And so I just did a quick calculation, Mr. Speaker. And when I look at the six-month uh, provision, I noticed that the recurrent deficit was $200 million for six months, Mr. Speaker. Annualized, that's $400 million. Now, I suppose one can say that, well, it doesn't take into account value-added tax. Fair enough point. Brings it down to $250 million, Mr. Speaker. That's interesting. Because the annual approved estimate calls for a deficit of only 55, those 52 million, which according to which in this mid-year statement is being supplemented or revised to be 55 million. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I don't know how you count that as something to boast about, unless we're going to have some miracle happen between here and, 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 and June. I mean, it could happen. But the numbers don't seem to add up to me, Mr. Speaker. Just me, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, the, somebody mentioned, and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about it now, I guess. Somebody mentioned uh, from their seat that business license come through in March. Fair enough. So let's look at, quote unquote, apples to apples. Okay? Let's look at import and export duties. Mr. Speaker, down 6%. Now, this is in an economy that they say is recovering and that we're so optimistic about. This is during a period when we have significant construction going on down the road at Bahama, Mr. Speaker. I'm looking at apples to apples, six months to six months. What about the Mr. Speaker, it says 6%, 6% down. I said something, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Let's go down to property tax, Mr. Speaker. They talked about the success that we're having in collection of property taxes. But, Mr. Speaker, it's down real property tax collection now. Something that we're supposed to be making efforts to collect is actually down 10% year, year on year. 10%. I guess we're waiting till the second half of the year to collect that too? I don't know, maybe. <laughs> and then we talk about... You see, you see, Mr. Speaker, the, the Minister for State, uh, uh, who says that there was an amnesty in the last year. But if I were to take into account, Mr. Speaker, his, his, his assertion that there's something to do with amnesty, I would expect this to be higher. I would expect this to be higher, Mr. Speaker, because the amnesty had nothing to do with the current collections. It has to do with old debt, debt that they couldn't collect. And so it should be an addition. It shouldn't be a, 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 a reduction, Mr. Speaker. So I, 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 you might want to think that one, rethink that one. But Mr. Speaker, going on, somebody talked about company fees and that this 
there's going to be this big uh, uh, bonus come March. Well, I hope that's true, Mr. Speaker. But comparing apples to apples again, or sour sop to sour sop in our context. No, papua. Or papua, that's it, papua. <laughs> papua, papaya to papaya, Mr. Speaker. Company fees have actually, have actually decreased by 4%. Now, Mr. Speaker, when I compare company fees, or take into account company fees decrease, import tax decrease, real property tax decrease, Where's the increase? It, starts to, it starts to paint a picture for me. It starts to paint a picture that all may not be well, Mr. Speaker. Down. On a point of order, please. All may not be well. <laughs> on a point of order. <laughs> yeah? Member, please, oh. the member stands behind you on a point of order. Chair recognize Mr. Member Speaker, for... the member is misleading the Bahamian public. Hmm. If you look at the total revenue projections that he's reading from, the same chart he's reading from, you will notice in the aggregate, we have increased by almost $35 million in revenue during this period. He would want the Bahamian people to believe that all is doom and gloom. But Mr. Speaker, if you actually look at the numbers in the aggregate, if you actually look at them in the aggregate, there's an increase in the variance for this fiscal year. He is misleading the Bahamian people. Very well. He is misleading to indicate everything is negative, when by far this shows that there's a positive increase in revenue by this government over the first half of this fiscal year. So I challenge him on misleading the Bahamian people about the good governance of this PLP administration, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Thank you Honorable Member. Member, Member for East Grand Bahama. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker uh, you know, um, being accused of I, this meeting is serious. I, 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 I appreciate the uh, enthusiasm uh, to, to, to try and defend this government, Mr. Speaker. But the, mem uh, the member is trying to confuse the Bahamian people, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, he wants to point out the positive. He's right. He's got excise, the excise tax has increased. What I am pointing out, Mr. Speaker, is the fact. How can I be misleading if this is the report that the government of the Bahamas put forward? I didn't come up with these numbers. Huh? And so, Mr. Speaker, if anybody, if anybody is misleading the Bahamian people, I respectfully submit it is the member for Elizabeth. He is trying to bamboozle the Bahamian people. The facts are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Okay. I mean, you know, you all think the Bahamian people are really silly. You really believe the Bahamian people have lost it. But let me tell you, one thing you don't understand, one thing this government does not understand, is that we have a much, much more educated population than we've ever had. We have young people who are questioning everything. And so these crazy statements that you make, that's a bad word, these wild statements that you make, Mr. Speaker, they have the ability to go to the numbers. They can see for themselves. So they can see for themselves, Mr. Speaker. Where is it wrong? You show where he is wrong. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. Member for East Grand Bahama. Member for uh, Golden Isles also takes. Uh, uh, speak on, yes, on a. Member for Golden Isles, you recognize on a, you, on a point of clarification. Just quickly, Mr. Speaker, um, the point was raised as to misleading and revenue up and down. Mr. Speaker, in the front of the book, the revenue performance for the first half of the year is broken down into roughly 23, well, 11 items of tax revenue. The member is for East Grand Bahama is correct that import and export duties are, are down by $10 million. But right below that, excise duties, which is also payable on imports and exports, is up by $26 million, Mr. Speaker. So when you, when, you, when you add the two, when you net it out, what happens is import, export duties, and excise, which accounts for things coming into and out of the country, is up by $16 million. Property tax is down by $6 million, Mr. Speaker, but as I said, in 2013, we had a property tax amnesty where there was a tr 
close to $30 million in back taxes were paid. And so the number for 2013 would have been elevated. When it comes back down to the normal trend, you would see it down by $6 million in, in um, the last year, Mr. Speaker. The member should also look at gaming tax, up $7 million. Tourism tax, up $11 million. Stamp tax, up $7 million. So when you take it all in aggregate tax revenue for the first half of the year, members, members. by $34.8 million. So uh, um, in support of my colleague, the member for Elizabeth, um, what we really should do, Mr. Speaker, or what the member should do is look at it in aggregate and not seek to suggest by just picking out the numbers that are down that revenue is down, Mr. Speaker. If we look at it in aggregate, we're up $35 million up from the previous year. Thank you, Honourable Member. Member for, member for East Grand Mahama, you have the floor. Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, these points of order, I, I don't know um, how you classify these interventions as points of order. But, Mr. Speaker, you know, again, the, the member, the, both members, are very quick to point out the aggregate. And the aggregate is what it is, and that is the picture that they want to present. They are certainly free to present that. The point that I make, though, Mr. Speaker, is that import duties and export duties are down 6%. It represents, or it gives an indicator of the health of our economy. Mr. Speaker, real property tax are down. That is a fact, Mr. Speaker. And company fees are down, Mr. Speaker. It is an indication of the health of our economy. Now, Mr. Speaker, the minister spoke about the, numbers, the, numbers. the excise tax. Oh, you will, we will all recall that in the last budget presentation, they, the government implemented new stamp ta uh, excise tax on cigarettes, and all the rest of it. So I would expect it to be up. That is, that is expected. Right? That is expected. But what is not expected is the decrease in these other items, Mr. Speaker. I mean, is the, is the, is the government saying that the increase in one form of tax caused the decrease in another form of tax? Is that what they're saying? It makes no sense. It absolutely makes no sense. The whole idea is to increase the government revenue, not decrease it, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, and then, Mr. Speaker, if we were to go down and we look at the interest and dividends, down $17 million. I presume that's BTC. I don't know. But significantly down, Mr. Speaker. What's going on, Mr. Speaker? What's going on? Increasing capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, be all that as it may. Be all that as it may. It is rather difficult, Mr. Speaker, to make any comparisons year over year in this mid-year statement due to the fact that the budget format changed from last June to this June, Mr. Speaker. And the lack of detail in this statement makes it really, again, a guessing exercise as to where the, the comparisons are. And this is why you remember, Mr. Speaker, last year at the budget presentation, the budget debate, this side called for a representation of the budget so that we can have com accurate comparisons. Of course, Mr. Speaker, like everything else, we were ignored at our, but there you go. It's they, they, they are in charge, Mr. Speaker. Be that as it may, Mr. Speaker, the government indicated that up to December 31st, 2000. 14, it has achieved 38.9% achieved of its revenue target. Mr. Speaker, while this does not give us tremendous concern given the timing of revenue collections, as indicated in the statement, it is worthwhile to note that many businesses and individuals stocked up on supplies prior to January 1st, that implementation. And so it will bear watching to see what effect this will have on trade revenue and value added tax in the early months of the new year. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, now that VAT is the law of the land, the government seems to be changing the argument for the implementation of VAT. At first, the government came to the people promoting this tax as a way to restore fiscal balance, with emphasis being placed 
on debt reduction. In fact, in the Prime Minister's budget communication in 2014, he said, VAT was designed to secure the desired and necessary enhancement in the revenue yield of our revenue system. VAT was supposed to be a part of a mixed measure that would allow the government to alienate the untenable structural imbalance between recurrent expenditure and revenue by 2015-2016 fiscal year to sharply reduce the GFS deficit by 2016-2017 and to arrest the growth in the government debt burden and move it into a steady downward path to sustainable levels. All fancy words, Mr. Speaker. But in the 2015 New Year's address, and we heard it here again today from the, the Minister of State for Public Works, the mandate seems to have changed. Based upon what I heard, it appears that we are now talking about using VAT revenue, any increased VAT revenue, for buildings and infrastructure and capital works and schools and all the rest of it, Mr. Speaker. Has the mission changed? Or is anybody talking to, uh, um, coming to us and telling us what it is? I call on this government to be accountable, transparent, and honest. I call on this government to pass a Fiscal Responsibility Act so that Bahamian people can see exactly where their tax dollars are going. I call on this government to earmark, through legislation, a portion of value-added tax collected to directly pay off outstanding loans, thus reducing our debt. The people deserve to know the truth about how their money is being spent. That, or as Dr. Rupin Freeport puts it, that dirty rat, has effectively reduced the buying power of, Bahamian dollars, of the Bahamian dollar by 7.5 cents overnight. And many Bahamian families are feeling the pinch. That's your colleague, man. That's your, that's your colleague. Indeed, just yesterday, while attending a track meet in Grand Bahama, I was challenged by a dialysis patient who wanted to know why should she have to pay value-added tax on her dialysis treatments. And these are very expensive treatments, Mr. Mr. Speaker. She wanted to know where is she supposed to find this extra money? Similar complaints have been lodged by other residents who argue that the cost of medicine has also increased because of that. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, an unhealthy situation, I would say. Additionally, I was surprised to learn yesterday that value-added tax is being charged at public health clinics. Mr. Speaker, I was under the impression that, like education, public health fees and services were exempt from value-added tax. What gives, Mr. Speaker? Is public education and health care exempt from that or not? Many Bahamians are also have also complained that value-added tax is charged on ATM withdrawals, cash checking at some banks, overdra overdraft fees, and other services. Yet, we are told that financial services were exempt from value-added tax. Is financial services exempt or not? And don't tell me that cashing a check or withdrawing funds from my bank account, my bank account, mm -hmm. is not a financial transaction. That's just insulting to all Bahamians. Mr. Speaker, this application amounts to double or maybe even triple taxation because you pay VAT to cash your check, again to withdraw your money from the bank, and then again when you pay for the goods or service. Mr. Speaker. Many Bahamians are trying to do the right thing, but VAT seems to penalize them for doing so. And while all of us, Mr. Speaker, may bank at the place where we uh, um, work, where, where, our, where our employers work, um, bank, but some of us don't. And so some of us have to go and cash our check 
and take it to another bank, deposit it, Mr. Speaker, right? And so you end up paying. I know some people, you know, they have so much money they don't have to worry about it. But some of us have different obligations at different banks. That's just how it is. And so we have to deposit money wherever it is. And we are being penalized, Mr. Speaker, unfairly by this government for trying to do the right thing, for trying to save money. Can't be right. It's cheaper to put your money under the, under the mattress or in a rock hole, Mr. Speaker. At least you don't pay the back. Mr. Speaker, the government wants to implement national health insurance in January of 2016, I think they said. Say to give health and coverage to all the Haynes. It was this promise that got the PLP elected in 2002, and they failed then. During the last Christie administration, 2000, 2007, it was estimated that national health insurance would cost $235 million, which would be funded by way of a payroll tax. That was then. And now the figures are almost doubled to get it effectively running today. That's according to their consultants. I would, I, I would want to caution the government that despite your political dream to get reelected at any cost, please be careful with what you promise and weigh the cost of your promises because the Bahamian people at this point are being overtaxed and they cannot be fooled again, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamian people want to know how much has been spent on Bamsi? Who's burned down that place, Mr. Speaker? Most particularly, where's their insurance coverage on the building? And when will someone be charged? They want to know how much, who will pay? for the recovery of that building, yeah. Mr. Speaker. The the they want to know how much been, has been spent on the Junkanoo Carnival, directly and indirectly through the Ministry of Tourism, Mr. Speaker. They want to know what is happening with the environmental levy fees, Mr. Speaker. They want to know how much has been collected in real property tax arrears? And what is the net amount accruing to the Bahamian people after the debt collectors have been paid? They want to know how much of the Bank of the Bahamas loans transferred to the Resolve, Bahamas Resolve Corporation has been collected? And what was the net amount transferred back to the government or to the bank in, in the, on those collections? In other words, what is the compensation for Resolve Corporation? <laughs> oh, I don't know. The World Relays are coming to the World Relays later on. They want to know what is the status of Urban Renewal 2.0's budget and small home repairs? Are we getting value for money, Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I took special note of this particular line item in light of statements made by the co-chairs recently in, in the news about the effectiveness of the small home repairs program. As many of my constituents complain that they have yet to be assisted despite their application and their unquestioned need. The co-chair proudly stated that over two million of the Bahamian people's money has been spent on this program and that as a result Many contractors have been employed, and the trickle-down effect has been multiples of that investment. Well, Mr. Speaker, he is correct on two points. More than two million has been spent, and there has been a trickle-down effect, but unfortunately, not in the way intended. Mr. Speaker, we will have a lot more to say about this shortly. But to quote the opening statement of the Auditor General 
in his audit of the program on behalf of the Public Accounts Committee for the period 1st July 2012 to 30th September 2014. I quote, the Urban Renewal Commission was mandated to manage small home repairs projects. This project's main focus is to repair homes for the, for the elderly, unemployed, and the disabled in the inner city communities. We observed that homes were repaired where occupants were not elderly, not disabled, and not unemployed. And it goes down from downhill from there, Mr. Speaker. The examples of slackness and possible abuses of public funds is disturbing to say the least, Mr. Speaker. I will leave it there for now, Mr. Speaker. But my only, the only thing that I would say is that if you have not earned it, return it. Mr. Speaker, I represent a Grand Bahama constituency. And so I must speak specifically for them. The economy for Grand Bahama remains disappointed, disappointing and far removed from the pie in the sky and bright lights of Vegas images presented by the good Minister of Tourism. Yes, member, member for Memories part. is here. Pause for a moment. Uh, the Chair is just uh, revisiting, wants to revisit the statement you made about a report from the Auditor General. For, did you say a public accounts committee that has not been presented in this House yet? That's correct. That ought not be stated. That is, that is a, against, contrary to the rules of the House. Okay. Mr. Speaker. It ought not be presented before the House has an opportunity to, to be. So order that that, be, that must be expunged. So for, for completeness, the statement you made with respect to what, you were, what the information from the Public Accounts Committee, the Chair orders thereby that that be expunged and withdrawn from the records of the House. No, no, no problem, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I'm so guided, Mr. Zero. Speaker. But it will come back, so I, I don't have any difficulty at all in, in, in bringing that, in, in bringing that up. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I represent, sorry, uh, yes, yes, Memories is here, and the hotel, hotel is open. But the success of any economy is based mostly on how people's finances have improved. And the people of Grand Bahama are still hurting. Little to no improvements over the last two years, and still no new casino operator, as promised since 2012. Does it really take that long, Mr. Speaker, to sign a deal, or was that all smoke and mirrors too? Like the Silver Sands Project, the new hospital, the new West Grand Bahama School and Sports Facility, the Fishing Hole Road, the Smith's Point Seawall, on and on, Mr. Speaker. It is such a re sad reality when you reflect on these great promises and many others made during election time. Who would have thought that Grand Bahama would still be in the economic state it's in after the opening of a whole new ministry that is staffed from top to bottom with a budget of over $9 million? Since coming to office, however, thus far, the only thing that we can put our hands to, Mr. Speaker, is the breaking down of a government building and the preparing and preparing the land, presumably for sale, although I hear it done sell. <laughs> Curious minds want to know if it was sold, and if so, to who or whom was it sold? And for how much was it sold? You don't want to answer? Still Today, with all the campaign talks, with three to five members of parliament, three, with three or five members of parliament, and two senior ministers, there is little to nothing to boast about in Grand Bahama. Very serious. Very serious. Very serious. You know, as a matter of fact, you know, it, 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 you might even want to, to be interested to know. What's happening in Port Lucaya? Member, Mr. Bahama, continue to address the chair and not even other as members. We speak. 
the members may be interested in what's happening in, in Port Vicaya. Where shop owners, vendors, today or yesterday, have been given notice that their rents are going up. Most of them can't afford it, Mr. Speaker. They can't afford it. And so some of them are already making plans to move, Mr. Speaker. Okay? And so they want to talk about posting about what's happening in Grand Bahama. When a, when a housekeeper can go home with $3.50 for busting her back or his back to prepare a room, you want to boast about that? I think, Mr. Speaker, you know, if that's your, if that's your uh, um, idea of doing better for Bahamian people, right, maybe that's all we deserve. It. I don't know. Me personally, I think we deserve better than that, Mr. Speaker. The member. No, yeah, yeah, better. I will recognize him at this time if the member is ready. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The chair recognizes honorable member for East Grand Bahama. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I can assure you I won't meet an hour and 23 minutes. At least I don't think so. Mr. Speaker, uh, following where I left off, the promises of providing quality new jobs within 100, within 100 days of taking office was a big joke when it was said, and it's still a big joke today. But the difference is, nobody's laughing now. As we engage in this midterm debate, job creation must be the number one priority for Grand Bahama during these contributions. I hope that the formula for job creation will be unveiled. The people of East Grand Bahama and indeed, the entire Bahamas will be listening. Mr. Speaker, as you know, I represent East Grand Bahama. A humble people, for the most part. We are blessed with some of the best behaved and intelligent children, I dare say, in the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, while I note reductions in spending at the Department of, of Education, I have in my hand a list of repairs that remains outstanding at our schools, some of which I would classify as urgent as they are a threat to expensive electronic equipment and to the children themselves as doors are literally hanging off the hinges in at least one of the class classrooms. Is this how we are balancing the budget, Mr. Speaker, at the expense of children? Mr. Speaker, I will share this list with the Minister of Education when I see him, with the hope that some form of immediate assistance will be forthcoming. <coughs> Similarly, Mr. Speaker, we have an issue with health care in Grand Bahama generally, and the eastern settlements continue to be at risk. Just this past week, I was reminded of two very serious inc incidents in these communities where utter confusion over emergency services almost led to the unnecessary harm to residents. Just last night, Mr. Speaker, in the execution of his duties, I'm told that one of our police officers in McLean's town was severely injured, leading to significant blood loss. Mr. Speaker, the nurse has been out of office for a while with no replacement. And so this young man had to be taken to Freeport by private car. We pray for him, Mr. Speaker, and hope that he will have a full recovery. Mr. Speaker, we thank the Minister of National Security for finally opening and staffing that police station in McLeanstown. However, as I have previously stated, these officers cannot be effective if they are not provided with the tools in order to do their jobs effectively. We need a boat. Mr. Speaker, because the area that they patrol includes Sweetings Key and the surrounding areas. And most importantly, they need vehicles. 
Mr. Speaker, because <coughs> from McLean's Town Station, they go all the way down to at least to Rocky Creek. It's not a small district. And so you can't expect the officers to utilize their own vehicles. It's just not going to work. The station in High Rock, similarly, has no vehicle, Mr. Speaker. I understand the one that they had, there seems to be some issue about the hood flying up and hitting the windshield and breaking and they want to, the police officer to pay for the repairs or something, another I understand. Some confusion, anyway. The end result being, he has no car. How does he effectively do his job or their job if they have no vehicle? And High Rock goes all the way from High Rock, well, I guess they would go all the way from Start Oil, all the way down to Gold Rock Creek. I mean, that's just not on. It's just not possible, Mr. Speaker, for them to do their, their job effectively. And as my colleague from Central Grand Bahama mentions from his seat, all of this, while we see urban renewal officers riding up and down, up and down wow. in police cars. At least they have police written on them. Yeah, well, they have police written on them. I, I can't say that they're police cars. All right? But, you know, Mr. Speaker, where are our priorities? Where are our priorities? A member, he yields the chair, recognized member for Ben and Grand Star for clarification. Mr. Speaker, I believe that if the member was very concerned about these things, he would have brought them to my attention. <laughs> he doesn't have to. He can, he can do it this way. But had he brought them to my attention, maybe they would have been solved by now. So please, I, I offer myself to all of you, if you have a problem, with any uh, unit or agency for which I have responsibility, bring it to my attention. I will try to assist you. You're going now. This is, well, I, I don't think that this is, a, I, I, well, maybe if he wants to do it this way, that's fine too. <coughs> but it would seem to me if he wants something done about it, he'll do it when it comes to his attention. Thank you, I remember. Thank, for thank, you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I thank the minister uh, for his offer. Um, however, uh, as, he's, uh, as he is aware, because he's been here a couple of years, so he knows that not only do I have to ask him, which I, which I will for sure, and I have mentioned it to him before, but I will ask him again, all right, uh, Mr. Speaker. I speak for your people. Member Yields, Bernie Grandstone. And you don't have to ask me. I'm just indicating to you a way to get the attention to, to the matter. But you don't have to ask me if you don't want to. I understand. I have no difficulty uh, member, please, asking the member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have no difficulty asking the member because my constituents know that I will do whatever I have to do in order to get them whatever assistance yes. they need. Yes. And so I, I make that, that plea, I make that plea uh, publicly, and I also make the plea publicly because I want them to know. I have to let them know. This is the medium where I let them know, Mr. Speaker, that I am asking. Right? They have been, he's been here a long time. He knows how this works. And so I have to let them know, Mr. Speaker. And so I've done that. Mr. Speaker, and, and again, we cannot balance the budget at, at, at this, the, the, the risk of, of health and safety. And so again, I ask the minister publicly to please, sir, see if we can do something about that situation. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> Going further, Mr. Speaker, I am told that by my, my, my constituents, the, the service at the police hospital, at the public hospital, has declined, and that the wait for service is unacceptable. Up to 15 hours in one case, from initial contact to final resolution of the problem presented. These are Bahamian citizens, Mr. Speaker, and we cannot balance the budget at the expense of the nation's health. Mr. Speaker, I noticed. A modest lag in social services spending to date. No, no, before. I must say, Mr. Speaker, that I am surprised, given the needs as mentioned earlier. Are we balancing the budget on the backs of poor people, Mr. Speaker? The very ones this government claims that they care so much about. Mr. Speaker, for a short minute, I want to comment on the liberalization of the telecommunications sector. Mr. Speaker, 
You know, it, it is kind of gratifying when you see with the passage of time that history proves you right. Mr. Speaker, we would all recall the tremendous hue and cry when the, the former administration finally was able to complete the um, <laughs> complete the privatization of BTC. Up and down, big ruckus from, on Bay Street, Mr. Speaker. But this government today, having seen that door open and what can happen, has now jumped on board. And they are further deepening the sector by finally allowing another competitor in the sector, as was intended, Mr. Speaker. I hope, Mr. Speaker, that in this exercise, that it will be transparent as they have promised it will be. Mr. Speaker, hopefully there will be no questionable questionable entrance, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the government says that 51% of the new company will be reserved for Bahamian participation. Those of us who are a little more skeptical of this government wonder how exactly this arrangement will be done. The former administration called for 9% of BTC to be divested to the Bahamian public with a further divestment in planned phases. That is a plan that was left in place, Mr. Speaker, and ready to go. But instead of following through with that plan, this government did the exact opposite. 2%, Mr. Speaker. And failing to get the return of 2%, they decided instead to go for something called a 2% economic interest. Now, I don't know what a 2% economic interest is, but it's interesting, Mr. Speaker, because 2% <coughs> economic interest, as I understand it, is BTC's portion uh, or the, the income from 2% of BTC shares will be put into a foundation for the benefit of the Bahamian people. And that is, that is not now, Mr. Speaker, I don't know that the foundation has been set up yet, because certainly that's gone very, very quiet. And so I don't know um, what the extent uh, uh, of that is, Mr. Speaker, but be that as it may, one has to wonder, with the so-called donation to John Canoe Carnival BTC has made, is that BTC, is that a part, is that contribution a part of our 2% or is that 49% coming out of the 49% that BTC is supposedly earned? It's interesting uh, to note, as I said before, the decline in the dividends from BTC this year, Mr. Speaker. Down 17 million. Very interesting. And it's interesting too, Mr. Speaker, the comments of the BTC union president in the NASA Guardian today. One of the justifications uh, for getting this 2% back is that it allowed the government to install, I guess, who it wants to install as the head um, to get BTC ready for competition. It is an interesting, interesting how the passage of time changes perspective because it's the same union leader who said we had to get this thing back, had to get it back. But now, he says, they're not ready. It's an observation. 
Given the action or lack thereof on that divestment exercise, are we to trust this government when they say they will cause 51% to be owned by Bahamians? I think not. I do not believe in their, it, is their, it is in their philosophy to see Bahamians have a significant equity stake in this country. Again, that's why they wanted this 2% back, Mr. Speaker, and why they wouldn't put 9% out for the Bahamian people to benefit, Mr. Speaker. They prefer the cradle-to-grave approach, keeping people dependent, Mr. Speaker, in my view, and I hope that doesn't affect if 51% is to be sold in the new company, I urge the government to make it a true initial public offering, and that it does not attempt to act as an intermediary or interfere in the offering. They have no credibility in that regard, Mr. Speaker. I also call on the government to fully divest itself of BTC shares so that there can be no claim of insider trading or unfair practice. How does an investor trust the regulator of a process to police that process, particularly when they have a vested interest in the industry? Mr. Speaker. And I do know something about that. This is only one instance where government is actively engaged unfairly against private interests. I call upon the government to remove itself from all anti-competitive positions in the private sector and allow private entities to grow and shoulder more of the burden of building this nation economically. Mr. Speaker, your words, not mine. With, Mr. Speaker, with, not worry, with the uncertainty in global economics, in global economies, especially those from whom we are interlinked, fiscal prudence, not waste must be the new mantra of this government and of governance. I renew the call for the government to fully enact in law the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Office of Ombudsman, the National Economic Council, and a nonpartisan Ways and Means Budget Council with the power to collaborative, collaboratively determine budgetary spending in such a way, hopefully, partisan political influence will be lessened and full transparency will be possible in these budget debates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.